Welcome to Beginning Ham Radio. We are sponsored by the Portland Amateur Radio Club. And this week, we're going to be talking about antenna feed lines. And Bruce Schaefer, AA7PB, is going to lead us off in talking about probably one of the best topics, because if you want to get the, the most power from your uh, radio transmitter to your antenna, um, you really want to pick the right feed line. So thanks, Bruce, for um, starting us off. And I'm going to stop sharing if you have some slides that you'd like to share. Yep. OK, antenna feed lines. I'm going to bounce back and forth between concept and um, things, discussion of things that are pretty close to actually buying cable and such, because feed lines are cable. Um, Max pointed me to two sources, which uh, turned out to be quite nice. Uh, they're both uh, issues of one of the magazines that you cho can choose from when you join ARRL. And if you do it online, you have access to all the magazines. Um, so even though I don't subscribe to On the Air, um, I can access it online. And I read these articles, and that helped me create these slides. So an antenna system uh, transfers energy so that it radiates and goes somewhere else. And a little bit of that energy hits other people's antennas. That same antenna system, it captures energy coming your way and allows you to um, either get voice or Morse code or digital uh, out of the energy that hits your antenna. The feed line is the connection between your radio and the antenna. And as such, it's part of the antenna system. Um, and uh, many people, as Max just hinted, would say that the feed line is the more important part of an antenna system, although um, I'm sure we can make arguments either way on that. Um, one exception is if you're using a handheld radio, the antenna is attached to the radio in, in most cases, and so there's no feed line. But uh, through adapters, and I actually have one nearby, where did I set it? Oh, how embarrassing it was in my hand. Oh, here it is. Hold it up to the camera. This is an example of an, ad an adapter that um, you can hook to a handheld. Uh, there's a couple different kinds. This one works on a couple kinds of handhelds. Um, and then you uh, hook your feed line to the other side and you can use an external antenna. Um, if we have extra time later, I can explain why that is a, often a good idea for handhelds, if, uh, uh, except for two things. One is makes them less portable, and the other is if you have a $30 handheld, it sometimes makes them go deaf when you, get, uh, you uh, add an external antenna for rather subtle reasons. Um, so another concept is we're transferring energy. Um, the anytime you have uh, alternating current, it produces radio waves, uh, and the frequency of the alternating current becomes the frequency of the radio wave. Um, but some of that energy will also produce heat. Um, an electric heater in your home is is trying to uh, produce heat and not trying to create radio waves. But an antenna system is trying to create radio waves and anything that becomes heat is wasted energy. And so one of the things we'll be talking about with feed line is how do you keep the feed line from producing heat rather than transferring the energy to the antenna? Uh, something that you can treat lightly because it's not super critical to understanding tonight's topic, but uh, it does come up is that uh, feed lines have impedance, which is similar to resistance, um, but as a combination of what's called resistance and reactance. And the, um, in, a, in many cases, you want the feed line to be 50 ohms and the antenna to be 50 ohms. <clears throat> when that's true, the energy uh, is transferred efficiently without reflection. There are cases when you want the feed line to be a different impedance. Um, and then you just have to deal with, uh, with handling the mismatch. And there's, there are ways to do that, which we'll hint at tonight. Uh, but that's not the feature of tonight's discussion. And there are, are really good antennas that are not 50 ohms. And so 
Um, sometimes you want to feed them with a feed line that's not 50 ohms either. Uh, if that sounds pretty strange and esoteric, it, it kind of is, um, but it, at least it's introduction to uh, something that will come up tonight. Um, in a really efficient system, you get almost all the energy into radio waves, but you always have some heat produced. Um, and again, one of the things we're trying to do is minimize the energy that turns into heat because that doesn't become radio waves. So. Uh, as I said, matching involves uh, trying to get the feed line to match what your transceiver expects, which is usually 50, um, and the antenna to match what the feed line is providing. And they're, if they're not uh, already a match, there's ways to arrange for them to be uh, close to a match. Anytime you have an impedance mismatch, uh, some of the energy reflects uh, off the place where there's the mismatch. Um, and it combines the energy that's outgoing, creating what's called a standing wave. You really don't have to spend much time understanding standing waves other to know that it's very traditional to talk about the degree of mismatch by measuring the standing wave. A standing wave of one to one is no standing wave at all and means there's a perfect match. Standing wave of three to one means that you've got an impedance mismatch that may be causing you some inefficiencies and you wanna get it down, probably never down to one-to-one, -one, but you need to probably get it below two and if possible, below one and a half. Um, and if you can manage to get the uh, standing wave uh, close to one-to-one, -one, um, a, a relatively small amount of energy will turn into heat, but we'll get to in a moment to why you'll still produce some heat. Um, if you put direct current through a cable that uh, has a conductor that's you know, significant, there's not gonna be a lot of resistance and a lot of heat produced. Um, but if you put low frequency um, through that same cable, things get a little bit more complicated. And if you shift to high frequency, um, most of the energy tra it transfers uh, near the skin of the wire. And the wire is usually a cylinder in the middle. And that means you're not using the full cylinder. Uh, if you look at the P diagram, um, energy is transferring in the green part and not much energy is going through the rest of that copper. It's typically copper wire, slight chance it's aluminum. Um, and that means that uh, more of the energy uh, gets converted into heat because you're not, the uh, copper that's there is not fully being used. Shift to very high frequency, as in uh, handheld, most handheld radios, uh, then uh, the amount of the skin that is transferring the energy is even thinner, and you get more resistance and more energy loss in that cable. There are various ways of dealing with that. And one way is to make the, the conductor fatter, both the center conductor and the shield of, in this case, we're talking about coax. Um, by making it fatter, you're gonna spend more money, but you're going to lose less energy and heat. Um, so that's what's going on here. You don't absolutely have to know why that's true, but anybody who's curious as to why um, you get more loss at very high frequency and, and even more so at ultra high frequency, um, that's the reason. So, so far I've been talking about coax. Uh, most of the coax we use in amateur radio is 50 ohms. Occasionally there's a reason to use 70 ohm coax. Um, one reason why we use 50 ohm coax is because that's what our transceivers are expecting. Um, but there are occasional reasons to vary from that. Um, a coax is any cable that has a center conductor that's surrounded by an insulator, that's surrounded by uh, some sort of shield, often a braid like shown in the, the picture here, and, and then another insulator that its main purpose is, is to protect it from the weather, but it also keeps it from shorting out should it touch uh, something else metal. Um, Ladder line is uh, the word, the general word we use for instead of having a conductor inside a shield, 
we have two conductors uh, that are spaced parallel. Uh, and there are many ways of doing that, but the most common way these days is what's called window line. The reason it's called window line is that the plastic that connects or that connects the two parallel conductors has windows in it. I'm not sure whether that's uh, to save on material or uh, it might have something to do with impedance. I haven't looked that up. But a typical window line is not 50 ohms, it's 450 ohms. There's ways of dealing with that mismatch that it work out pretty well, but it adds some complexity to the system. So in simple um, systems, we usually use 50 ohm coax so that we don't have to worry about how to deal with the difference in impedance. Um, but we'll talk more about why we might want to use ladder line. Um, here's a table that starts giving us a hint. Um, the, uh, this table is in, uh, in decibel loss, um, which is not particularly intuitive, uh, but it's traditional. I've got another table that's much more intuitive. I'll get to it in a moment. Um, 0.9 uh, decibels is uh, probably about 15%. I haven't looked it up, but it's uh, less than one decibel is, is a pretty small percentage loss. When you get up to three decibels, you're losing 50% of your power. And if you get up to six, you're losing three quarters of your power. Um, but notice under seven megahertz, none of these are, are anywhere close to three decibels. So you can pretty much use whatever's cheapest. Um, seven megahertz is approximately um, the frequency of what amateur radio is called the 40 meter band. So if you're doing all your work in 40 meters, you might just fix uh, inexpensive cable and uh, you'll be happy. If you're also running um, 10 meters, um, which is characterized in this uh, by the 28 megahertz column, you see that that same cable has got more losses, uh, uh, particularly RG8, uh, RG58 and RG8. Um, still not 50% loss, but it, now it's not trivial loss anymore. Uh, the more expensive, fatter cable, for the reasons I was talking about before, um, keeps the loss under control. Uh, Belden 9913 and LMR400 are substantially more expensive per foot than the two RG, RGs in this table. Uh, window line, ironically, is, is less expensive than uh, the, the other two and is even better. So in some circumstances, you want to use window line to save some money on cable and to uh, reduce your losses to uh, lower amounts than uh, the, the coax. But then you have to deal with the difference in impedance, which uh, is a confusing topic that we'll touch on. If you push on to the third column, uh, 146 is right in the middle of the two meter band where we do a lot of work uh, in emergency communications, including with handheld radios. Particularly, uh, it's a frequency that's that one of the most useful ones for local communication uh, within a metropolitan area, as long as there are not too many mountains in the way. And most metropolitan areas have two meter repeaters to deal with those mountains. Um, and you see that RG58 is not your friend if you've got 100 feet uh, uh, between your uh, transceiver and your antenna, it's going to have uh, well over 50% loss if it's 100 feet, if you use that inexpensive cable. If you use the fatter, more expensive cable, 100 feet is gonna cost you quite a bit, um, but it'll cut that loss down to uh, much less than 50% and maybe worth it to get more of the energy to your antenna. Um, and again, there may be a reason to use ladder line for that case, and we'll talk more about the trade-off. Um, the, the more expensive cable is even more justified at 440 megahertz, uh, which is characteristic of our most common UHF band, uh, the 70 centimeter band. Uh, as you can see here, there's a huge loss with cheap cable and, a, and still a measurable loss. Um, one way to get it under control is not to use 100 feet. If, uh, if you're using LMR 400, you can save two ways if you can get that feed line down to say 25 feet. One is you only have to buy 25 feet of it instead of 100. And the other is um, the, um, the loss will not be 2.7, it'll be uh, about 0.7, uh, which is quite acceptable, uh, probably about 20% loss 
rather than about 50% loss. Um, so short is good, particularly at UHF, and fat is good at, at UHF frequencies. Here's that same information, except in a more intuitive form. Instead of having to worry about decibels, which are a logarithmic scale, we're talking about how much energy actually gets to the antenna. The first column says with that ladder line, 450 ohm ladder line, assuming that you've got a good match, 99% uh, of the energy will get to that uh, antenna, 3.5 megahertz characteristic of the 80 meter band. Um, and if you've got a, a pretty bad mismatch, six to one uh, SWR, you still get 98%. As long as your transceiver doesn't pull back its power because it doesn't like the mismatch, whatever energy your transceiver decides it's gonna put out, 98% of it will get to the antenna. Um, it's less perfect at, uh, at 28 megahertz, which is a uh, 10 meter band, but still pretty good if you're using ladder line. And uh, you, you could even consider using it uh, for uh, the two meter or, uh, band as shown here because the percentages are, are pretty impressive even with a mismatch. Most of us don't use ladder line for two meters uh, for reasons I'll get to next. Um, so instead we're, we'll probably be looking at um, things like that LMR 400 uh, that I talked about on the previous slide. So let's talk about ladder line. Why would you use it? We've talked about it, low loss. And if you can deal with the impedance mismatch, uh, uh, you can also save some money because it's relatively inexpensive per foot. But what are the disadvantages? One is you need a way to deal with the impedance mismatch. Um, if you're only operating at one particular frequency, you might be able to do it with a fairly simple circuit uh, or transformer. Um, but if you're operating at a, a, very, a, a variety of frequencies, you may need a pretty robust antenna tuner, which will drive up your budget and uh, probably overwhelm the savings that you uh, saved in cable. But there's still reasons to do it or to consider it. There are some antenna systems where uh, you can't get the antenna itself uh, to be anywhere close to 50 ohms, it's going to be a lot closer to 450 ohms and 50 ohms. So using that ladder line at 450 ohms uh, actually gets you a better match to your antenna and then uh, use an antenna tuner to match it to your transceiver. So people that do a lot of HF work, uh, if they can deal with the, the next thing, which is the challenges of installation, they can fall in love with ladder line uh, because it gives them a lot of flexibility in the HF bands. The, the gotcha with uh, ladder line is because it doesn't have a shield if it's anywhere near a gutter, um, a metal roof, or a downspout, um, some of that energy get, gets transferred to that other metal stuff. And it also ch uh, changes, um, could potentially change uh, other things um, but mainly you end up with coupling with other metal and you lose energy that way. Uh, if you run your uh, ladder line at right angles to the metal things like right angles to a gutter, then there's not as big a problem. But if you run it parallel to a gutter or a, um, a downspout or something similar, um, it's, it's not gonna work very well and you're gonna need to move it. Uh, rooting it sometimes within a, a, a house can be a problem as well. If, you got copper plumbing or, or other metal plumbing. Um, if it ends up running along near copper plumbing, that can be a problem. Coax uh, is pretty impervious, impervious to uh, metal objects nearby. The antenna itself has to be away from metal objects, but the coax, you don't have to worry about it as much. Question. Please. What about running a window or ladder line across the ground? Um, I don't have any experience with that. Max, do you know anything about ladder line close to earth? Yeah, in general, you wanna keep it uh, one or a couple feet off the ground. Um, and you can do that by you know hanging into trees or using wood stakes or something. Uh, I think the bigger issue with uh, low line, um, both coax and ladder line, just put it in some place where people aren't gonna run into it or in my case where my partner wants to mow the, uh, the backyard and then he ends up, um, getting it wound up in the, the mower blades. <laughs> Somebody doesn't like that. Yeah, probably neither of you like that. No, All right, thanks. 
So uh, the conclusion I come and, and others can, can uh, word it and come to a different conclusion is um, that ladder line is, is commonly used for certain types of antennas that are not going to be resonant by design at the frequencies they're used. So they're gonna have a uh, high impedance and um, then you, uh, you get a closer match with, with your ladder line, you get very low losses. When the SWR is high um, on that uh, feed line, uh, the, uh, you don't end up cranking up a lot of loss because the, uh, the feed line uh, it has so much loss, to, uh, so, so low a loss to begin with. Uh, one way of thinking about that is when you get high SWR, um, it, it, that literally means a standing wave. But what it's probably a better description is reflected energy. The energy that gets reflected back to the other end of the feed line gets reflected again and goes back out to the antenna. It may make several trips, but any energy that doesn't get turned into heat will get trans, uh, turned into radio waves. So if you can make that transmission line such that it, very little energy is turning into heat, then that high uh, amount of reflection doesn't hurt you because the energy eventually gets out the antenna and, all, and becomes good, good RF, uh, good radio frequency waves. Um, when, in that same non-resonant case, uh, you're, you have other reasons why you need an antenna tuner. So it's not really an additional cost. Uh, you, you're, gonna, you're ahead of that direction anyway. For two meter work, uh, because it's relatively easy to uh, buy or build an antenna that's uh, close to resonant uh, and close to 50 ohms, uh, matching it with 50 ohm coax avoids all the issues of, of uh, running it near metal and uh, avoids the need for a separate antenna tuner. So that's why coax is so popular in two meters and fairly popular in HF work as well. But Again, there is a, uh, a ladder line camp in HF and, and those people have really good reasons for going that way. Um, so here's a summary of what I've already said about SWR is kind of a way of thinking about uh, how much energy might be lost to heat depending on how efficient your, um, your feed line is. And that low SWR becomes more important for VHF and UHF because um, the feed line is going to be uh, less efficient than it is at high frequency. So when you're thinking about feed lines, the longer, the more energy loss. So longer is bad unless you, uh, you can justify it to get that antenna up high. Sometimes you really want that antenna high for reasons we can talk about either during the Q&A or another night. And if you have a really good reason to go up high, then you might be able to justify a long feed line, but you're gonna pay for it with some loss and you're gonna pay for it in dollars when you have to buy that extra feed line. Um, energy is also uh, lost proportional to frequency. And there's not a lot you can do about that except buy more expensive cable uh, or, uh, uh, perhaps use ladder line if you've got a way of handling the match. Um, the amount of loss is also proportional to uh, how much standing wave you have because standing wave is representative of reflected energy that takes multiple trips to the cable. And um, so multiple trips means more loss to heat. Uh, energy, the energy loss per foot is much lower in ladder line than coax. So that's why it's a contender in some cases. Um, and while length is, is bad for energy loss, thickness is good because the fat uh, conductors um, allow for more of the energy to be transferred uh, to the other end without turning into heat. Uh, for the same reason, when we're wiring a, uh, an electric stove or a uh, a dryer, we're going to use fatter cable uh, because uh, we're going to need to transfer a lot of energy to that stove or that dryer compared to a light bulb. So let's get uh, a little bit into why do you need to know all this stuff? Um, well, because when you go to buy coax, you need to think about the distance you're going to run and the frequency you're going to run. Um, if it's 
uh, a, a high frequency, uh, like a 40 meter or 20 meter band, and it's a short distance, inexpensive cable's fine. Um, if it's a long run or the UHF band, you need to raise some money to, uh, to afford fatter cable, higher quality cable, uh, because uh, you're gonna have more loss based on the distance and uh, more loss based on the frequency. So you're gonna need to consider making up for that by spending more money on thickness and quality of cable. Um, in some more esoteric situations, not typical of two meters or 70 centimeters, you may also need to consider the impedance of the antenna and uh, how much uh, standing wave you're gonna have on the feed line. Um, but th those are less common in two meters where you're most, uh, or in 70 centimeters where most of us operate our technician licenses. Um, and then uh, another decision just before you lay down money is, um, do you need to buy a particular length of cable with the connectors on both ends? Uh, when in doubt, the answer is yes. Um, get uh, get a factory made uh, connectors, factory attached uh, connectors are gonna be probably pretty reliable and um, you don't have to fuss with both the equipment needed to add connectors and the skill needed to solder on or crimp on those connectors. But if you do, do a lot of cable work and you like, like uh, learning a new skill and don't mind spending some money on soldering irons and, uh, and or crimpers, um, then you can save some money on cable by buying uh, random lengths of cable and cutting them to the exact length you need and adding the connectors to each end. The, uh, the standard in ham radio for, for historic reasons is uh, the cables have PL259 on each end. PL stands for plug. Um, and so usually that's the kind of uh, connector you're going to want on both ends, whether you put them on yourself or not. Um, but some equipment nowadays comes with end connectors. Um, some antennas you can, uh, if you go out of your way a little bit, you can get the antenna with an end connector. And that's something to consider because end connectors are more efficient and more waterproof. Um, and so uh, if you have an opportunity to, to buy equipment with end connectors for not much more money, then that's going to say when you go to buy that cable, you're going to want the uh, male end connectors on it. Questions about the shopping guide here? Yeah, I just, um, Fred might talk about it later, but uh, he was on a couple um, weeks ago and was talking about end connectors. And I've always purchased PL259 connectors, um, mainly because that's what I've always done before. And that's what's on the back of uh, most um, HF and even VHF radios. But I've, I'm going to be switching over to uh, the end connector. Um, like you said, it's a little bit more expensive. I think they're twice the price at about $5. Um, I do make my own cables, uh, but it seems like a, a much better connector. And I really like the fact that it's waterproof without having to wrap a bunch of tape and other stuff around it. Yeah, we didn't talk about that. The, uh, we, maybe we can do that in the Q&A, but if you, if you have a PL259 uh, connector outdoors, it's going to be connected to um, the opposite gender of, of the same standard, which is... Uh, so, SO239. Yeah, SO259, uh, uh, right? Um, 239. 239. I have trouble with my numbers. Um, SO, I think, stands for socket. Um, and once those are connected, if, if it's going to be more than a couple of days uh, of dry weather, you're going to want to uh, study up on how to wrap it and waterproof it because water encroachment through those connectors gets into the coax and ruins the coax, uh, which is not uh, true generally of, of end connectors as long as you have a tight uh, fit. I can go back to any slide, but for the moment, I'm going to uh, stop the share and I can bring the share back um, if, uh, if Can I add something? Yeah. If you, uh, so if you are making your, if you want to make your, your, uh, your uh, cables, uh, buy a crimper. 
uh, because uh, soldering um, the PL or type N connectors, etc., it's a bad idea. Because the thing is, uh, those connectors there, there is a lot of uh, metal on those connectors. You need to have a, a so, uh, you know pretty high power sol soldering iron, and if you um, you know stay too long, so you're gonna melt. Uh, you know inside the connector there is a, a dielectric, and you're gonna melt that dielectric. And when you melt that dielectric, you change the impedance of your connector. And uh, a crimp when you crimp your cable, you don't have that problem. So Fred, uh, when you do, do crimping uh, with your connectors, you uh, you solder the center connector and then and crimp the outer. Uh... So on the on the um, on the PL um, and SO two thirty nine, for example, the most of the one you're going to find, you have to solder the 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 tip, uh, you know, the, the the middle connector. So you're going to have to do that that soldering anyway. Uh, so be careful to not eat that thing too much. Have a you know a soldering iron that um, is uh, you know uh, hot enough uh, to do a you know to to quickly uh, solder that thing. And then for the outside, the outside is the, the main problem. The outside you need to crimp it. Right. And uh, for the Type N connector, that is not a problem because uh, the the pin you uh, I mean you the, the pin gets out. You solder your pin and then you push your cable and you crimp. Right. So you never have to uh, to uh, to uh, to to get the, um, to warm the the um, the dielectric on the on the type N. They're easier to make. Yep. And if, you, if, if anybody's interested in, um, I just don't want to share my screen here for just a second. If anybody's interested in actually um, making their own cables, because um, like Bruce said, when you're when you're first starting out, uh, it doesn't really make sense to make your own cable if you don't want to invest in a lot of like the crimper and a soldering iron. So I, this is Ham Radio Outlet, and you can see that uh, for RG8 uh, X, they have a lot of different sizes from 40 inches uh, for 40 feet, 25 feet, 18 feet, all the way down to like I think one or two feet. Uh, down here at the bottom or six feet. So it's it's very easy to buy the correct length of cable. But if you really are going to make a lot of them or you're going to use a lot of them, then the best thing to do is then just buy a large roll uh, or a bulk roll. And what I usually do is just buy a large roll like this 250 foot roll um, for $140. And then I'll uh, buy the connectors to and the connectors for um, PL 259s uh, are right here, and that's the part number for Ham Radio Outlet. They're uh, 289 a piece, um, but like I said, I uh, would probably I'm going to start using N connectors, um, and you can see that they're uh, for 4.99 or five dollars a piece. And then in order to crimp them, you want some type of crimper like Bruce showed, um, and the basic one is going to be this PowerWorks True Crimp. Uh, it's $43 uh, to start with, but then in order to crimp, and that's, uh, it comes with the correct parts for crimping um, power poles, which is one of our upcoming uh, sessions. But if you want to crimp um, coax connectors, you would have to either buy this PowerWorks die set for $60, um, or you would buy the uh, crimper and uh, already with the the die set in them. And I, I don't see them right here, but they, they do have them here in this crimp bag. So for $104, so it's a little bit more expensive, it comes with the crimper and the dies and a, and a $5 bag. So that's kind of my two cents. You, if you don't have money, you can go on uh, Amazon and you're gonna find uh, a crimper um, and you can order the dies you want. Mm -hmm. Uh, you don't have to have a you know a full set of die because uh, some of the die you will never use them. But uh, you can buy one die and you're going to pay you know thirty bucks for the crimper and the die. That's a good point. Yeah, because out of all those dies that are all the dies that I use, I only use the the one for um, RG8X and the one for uh, for uh, Anderson Power Pole. Yep. I was going to mention I bought a crimp kit through Quicksilver Radio. And it came with the dies for power pole, for RG, whatever, you know, 
IRT 213, 8X, but it also had the coax strip tools that could handle either types of coax cables. And I was a little wary of trying to make the, the cuts, the necessary cuts to the coax. You know, you have to cut the shield just to the right amount and all that. So it's something you have to also add in is the coax stripper. So the, um, the thing with that stripper is um, uh, you take, for example, RG8. Uh, RG8, you're going to find that cable. Every brand is selling RG8 because RG8 is not, uh, it's a standard basically. And uh, so if you buy that at uh, one brand, the, the sizes, they're going to vary from one brand to the other. So if you are, if you use that thing and you set it, so let's say you buy a, uh, RG8 uh, cable at DX Engineering. You set that thing and you do uh, your cable. Then you buy uh, the same, R I mean, an RG8 from another brand. You use that thing and you're going to nick the, the center connector or you're going to cut the, 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 um, you know, the outside bread because you need to reset that tool for every, you know, different brand of, of cable. Absolutely. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. But uh, it's easier for me than trying to do it with uh, just a, an exacto knife. So, I found I, I, that some of the crimping tools, I, I highly suggest that you buy the ratcheting kind. Right. Um, they're gonna be more expensive, but there are ones out there that are non-ratcheting, they're gonna be cheaper. Uh, but the ratcheting ones uh, will be a lot easier to use and get a full crimp on. Because you can, if you need to, you can release your hand a little bit. It stays in place, and then you can get another grip on it if you got, uh, if you need to. I was also going to mention um, at a recent one of these uh, beginner uh, lessons, I asked about changing from two fifty nine PL two fifty nine to end connectors, and I remember all the experienced. Uh, folks were nodding your head. Yes, you should do it. Yes, you should do it. So I, I want to mention that I did do it. I did make the change and I am seeing slightly better, um, you know, it's not, it's not great, but it's slightly better um, noise that I was, the noise is reduced. It just seems to work a little better with the end connectors. Yeah, that's great, Michael. I mean, you know, every time you put in a connector, you're going to get a little bit of loss. Um, so anytime that you can use higher quality connectors, um, I find that um, Ham Radio Outlet, their connectors are pretty good. Uh, if you go on eBay, uh, you may or may not get um, good quality connectors. It's the same, it's the same with um, the coax. So you need to be careful on eBay if you buy coax because uh, you find some you know, shady, um, I wouldn't say Chinese company, but um, you see what I mean? And um, I know someone who just bought uh, a spool of uh, coax. Uh, I mean, it was two years ago before the COVID. Uh, so a big spool of coax, 100 feet. Uh, it was happy because, oh yeah, now I have, uh, I'm set for life. The problem is the center conductor was um, uh, iron instead of copper. And it was just the iron with the clad of copper around and the, the cable was pretty bad. I mean, he had to throw it away. I think he tried to sell it at um, a flea market. Yeah, I guess even when you go to a flea market, you probably have a better chance if you go to, for example, Rick Rial and buy, buy cable there. But um, uh, used coax cable isn't necessarily always the bargain that um, the price tag indicates. Oh, one more thing about cable. Um, one other thing that you should choose to uh, crimp instead of solder. Um, some of the cable you're going to buy, for example, LMR 400. Uh, I, I mean, there is other cable. The outside uh, bread is aluminum. Good luck soldering that. <laughs> well, cool. Any other coax questions or comments? Um, oh, I have one, uh, if I can share my screen real quick. So in the QST, and this is uh, the March of 2020, 
And just as a reminder, if you are an ARRL current member, you can actually log into their website and pull up their archive of QST magazines digitally online. You can, um, they both uh, on your smartphone or your tablet, on your PC, um, and you can read those. They go all the way back to, I think, around 2011, and there's ways to get other uh, back issues beyond there. But their cover issue was make your own open wireline, which is uh, very similar to ladder line. Uh, it's usually a little bit wider uh, apart, um, and it's usually 600 or so ohms. Um, and so if I go in here into page 30, uh, gives you three pages of kind of building your own open wire line for those. Uh, it is pretty inexpensive because essentially it's two wires with some type of spacer, whether it's 3D printed, whether it's a, a, a piece of a wood dowel that you have um, made a couple of drills through. Um, so check that out if you get a chance. The other comment I wanted to make uh, came from Dan. He uh, kind of reminds us um, that when you use ladder line, um, the kind of the rule of thumb is don't get it close to anything like the ground or a piece of metal uh, equal to about one length uh, or one width, sorry, of the, the actual wire line. So ladder line, the 450 ohm is about an inch and a half, maybe a little bit less. So if you can keep it an inch and a half away from metal and the ground, that's ideal. It's more than that. Is it? Yeah, it's one foot per uh, per inch. One, oh, one so foot if, per, okay. If you have a line that is one, two inches uh, wide, uh, you need to have two, two feet. Two feet, all right. And that's the minimum. And that's away from like gutters and things like that? Yeah. It's one of the it, difficulties in, 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 in ladder line is that it's not, it, you can't just open a window and then throw your, la uh, your feed line through and then close the window. Especially if you have, a, if you, have um, you know, aluminum window frame or stucco or stuff like that. Yeah. The, you know, like Bruce said before, uh, you know, the people who are using uh, window line or uh, ladder line, they know what they're doing and they're using it for a specific reason uh, because of all the prime installing those lines. So if you don't know what you're doing, use a coax. Yeah, we use a uh, ladder line for field day, but it's easy because uh, we're out in the field and there's not a lot of metal objects around. It makes it easy. With, with coax, there's no, the issue with coax on the ground is not, uh, it's, it's not a problem to have it on the ground because of RF. It's just because you don't want somebody stepping on it or tripping on it or, or mowing it, like you were saying, correct? They so can just sit on the ground. Yep. I mean, yeah. You any can... any any line you don't want them on the ground because a car that drives through or someone stepping on it can you know after a while get crushed and you change the impedance you can break the um, the, the the dielectric inside I mean uh, it's it's not good but uh, uh, coax are very very easy to use you can run them through you know through walls uh, along a wall a stucco or a, you know metallic pole. You don't care. Just put them, and 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 then you. Uh, the only thing you need to be careful is to uh, you know winterize that thing so the water doesn't get inside, and that's it. Any any uh, known interactions with uh, running Ethernet and coax nearby? Uh, yes. Um, so. I don't think uh, Bruce mentioned that, but um, the, uh, the, um, what we call uh, the window line, it's a balanced line. The coax is an unbalanced line. And um, it's unbalanced because in the coax, in fact, you have three, con three connectors. You have three wires. You have the center connector. And because of the, um, of the, sh the, the, um, the, the skin effect, you have a, on the shield, you have one connector on the inside and one connector of the out, on the outside. So if you have an antenna that is unbalanced, the problem you're going to have is you're going to have some current going, um, you know, some earth current going on the outside of the of the of your coax, and that may couple with uh, your Ethernet connection, or, you know, your Ethernet cable, or you know, uh, anything uh, basically. So that's what we call a common mode current. 
And sometimes when people are, uh, they have a, you know, a, an unbalanced antenna, they don't deal with the common mode current. So first of all, that pick up a lot of noise. And second of all, uh, you know, when you're transmitting, you turn on or off your AC or your phone start ringing or, you know, you start having weird effects like that. It's because uh, that uh, outside, you know, that common mode current that is outside your coax is coupling with other things inside the, the, the house. How do you suggest shielding between your Ethernet cable, like a Cat5 cable, and your coax? You don't do that. You remove the command mode current. So to All remove right. the command mode current, you need to use a one-to-one -one balance. That's uh, one of the Bruce talk a couple of weeks ago, I think, or I don't know, a few weeks ago. So, so even, we, go ahead, Bruce, sorry. It, Usually a ballon is exactly the right way to go. And there's there's uh, various ways to set up a ballon that a, a shortcut to a ballon is if, if you haven't stretched out all your cable and you're, you've got some left over to actually put the excess next to the, uh, where it connects to the antenna as a coil. And the uh, inductance um, on the shield that produced by that coil uh, will choke off uh, much of the common mode current. If if that's not possible, uh, you can also buy uh, ferrite to uh, attach to the outside of the coax where it connects to the antenna, and that will also tend to choke off the com common mode current. Um, but the the standard for doing it is, is to actually use a ballon uh, in between the cable uh, and the antenna. So is there some physical shape that that ballon, I mean, like a certain diameter of coil that you yeah. do? Okay. Yeah. And that can be all be looked up, I imagine. So if you have, um, if you're, um, if you're on two meter, that's not going to be much of a problem because you're going to uh, work with an antenna that is most of, uh, of the time they're going to be balanced, but, uh, or you're going to have the, the manufacturer, uh, you know, in the manual for your antenna, they're going to say, okay, do a six wrap of coax on, you know, on the three inch, um, you know, uh, on, on something that is three inch uh, diameter and do, you know, five, six or seven, depending on what they say, you do that and you're going to be fine. The problem is going to be more on HF. On HF, uh, you should put a ballon at the antenna because, um, uh, because you want to eliminate the common mode current coming from the antenna, you should put a ballon uh, at the ingress of your house. So the, the cable going you know, from the antenna and entering your house at that place here, you should put a, a ballon and you should also put a, um, a, a grounding because you don't want to have um, you know, lightning coming into your house. You want to avoid Having a, a you know a high um, uh, if you have a static electricity or thing like that you want to you know try to limit that eliminate that thing, and that should take care of all your common mode current. And then you can put one more at, you know behind your radio, if you want to um, you know be perfect. But um, you don't have to be perfect. Okay, let me ask the question. You just introduced all sorts of additional electrical stuff to this feed line of course and so how much how much loss has now been added to that if you put all the things you just described what so, kind of a ballpark figure are we losing one percent ten percent no no so if you it depends what how you build your thing but if you use a, a fairly reasonable build ballon i'm not talking about the super expensive uh, ballon you you uh, if if it's a one to one ballon you should have uh, something like you know between 0 to db loss if you put a, a lightning arrester or something like that you're going to have a 0 1 db loss if you put um, uh, you know uh, two connector back to back you're going to have 0 1 db loss uh the, the those loss will be really negligible compared to anything else and don't focus on the loss because uh, you have some people that are focusing so much on the loss that uh, they you know their system they have zero losses but their system is not working either or they have something that is very inconvenient because um because uh you know they're focusing so much on the loss that they're you know losing the big picture so you know, 
okay. if you if you are talking about uh, you know uh, uh, a gigahertz uh, or UHF, the losses then you need to be a little bit more careful. But two meter and down, you kind of you you are a little bit careful, but you don't have to focus too much on that. All right. Yeah, and, uh, like Bruce and uh, Fred were mentioning, um, you can use a Balin. Uh, the other way that a lot of amateur radios uh, operators do it is by uh, using a ferrite um, ring. Uh, this picture in the upper right-hand corner kind of shows you a, a few ways that people remove the RF or prevent the RF from getting onto like AC power lines or DC power lines uh, or coax cable. And what they have pictured in here is, it doesn't say specifically, but, oh, here it is right here. It's a FT24043. And you just wrap uh, five or six wraps of the coax cable through. There you go. Bruce has, uh, he's showing it too. It's and fairly big. Yeah, it is. Um, they're not too expensive depending on where you buy them, uh, five to $8 a piece. Um, and you can easily use that uh, before you go into the shack or before you go into the radio to um, choke off the common mode current that but, goes on that uh, coax. But then so, you have to be careful with the bend ratio of your yeah. cable to not make too tight a rhythm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you see uh, the fat cable, you instead of using the rings, uh, you, you get to clip on ones and you may have to use several to, to get the choke effect that you're looking for. And uh, I was saying to, to put a choke at the entrance of your house because uh, uh, you don't have a, uh, you will never have a, a perfect system, a very well balanced system. So uh, if you choke at the antenna, you're going to eliminate most of the common mode current, but then your cable is going to still couple with the antenna. Uh, so you want to choke that somewhere else. Yeah, and like, uh, so Bruce was mentioning the clip-ons, I think. Um, so you yeah. can do clip-ons. Uh, clip-ons don't, like, the more clip-ons you add, you're not uh, multiplying uh, the amount of choking. Um, so you may need five, six, seven uh, clip-ons in order to do the same as just two turns of uh, through a, um, a ferrite ring. So, I mean, it's certainly possible, but just keep in mind that... Uh, this is going to be the most efficient way to do it, um, but you can certainly in, in situations where you aren't able to um, pass enough through a ring, maybe just do a clip on. The ham radio workbench is a podcast um, that is done by a few ham radio guys about three episodes ago. Um, if you look it up, they have their own website, ham radio workbench, I think .com. Um, they talk for, I think, about three, three and a half hours on ferrite rings uh, and ferrite beads. Um, yeah. And the other place to look is um, the recent QSO um, Virtual Ham Radio Expo has a um, presentation on uh, using ferrite rings and clip-on ferrites uh, for um, uh, suppressing common mode RF. This was on September, um, it was about two weeks ago. And I'm not sure if there is a way to uh, sign up or get that presentation unless you have already had a ticket for it. I, I have a question. Yeah, uh, go ahead. So I heard someone describe what I would call a, a messy ballon uh, with just the wire cabled up. At least that's what my dad used, to, what I hear called was a messy ballon. What, what is the, a uh, typical number of, uh, I'll say, loops that you would need in, in, a, in that kind of a configuration. It seems like it's kind of, I'll say, I have a little bit extra coax. I just, I'm just putting my ham shack together and I've got, a, I've got it inside on the, like just connected to the radio. I don't have it actually out at the end of the feed line at the, at the antenna, but what's it? rule of thumb for how many turns I want on that coax for a messy ballon. For 40 meter is kind of my, what I'm enjoying right now. Yeah, Fred, did you want to take that? Well, yeah, sure. I, I don't know. I don't remember. Um, okay. it's, it's called an ugly ballon. Um, That's right. He called it an ugly ballon. In my mind, I think it's messy, but. It's, um, uh, the, 
the thing that's going to be the most important is going to be the diameter of your winding. Um, uh, the lower the frequency, the bigger diameter, diameter you're going to need. But usually it's going to be, a, the, but I don't remember how, um, you know, that, di, you know, what is the optimum diameter. But if you take, uh, you know, between, uh, uh, you know, around 10, 12 turns, you should be okay for 40 meters. But don't put it on the, on, on don't wind it too, you know, too tight in diameter. You should have something that is at least, you know, three inches or something like that, or maybe more five inch. Oh, um, certainly. I, I got like about a, a, a foot, 12 to 14 inch diameter. Overall, the windings are about 12 to 14 inches. The uh, photo that I'm showing now shows a lot of the ugly balance where people wrap it around PVC pipe. And yeah, it's a two inch or three inch PVC pipe. Neat and fancy. It's not necessary to necessarily wrap it around something. Um, a lot of people will, I was just trying to take a look at one here. Uh, here's an example of just somebody that has wrapped it on, around itself. So it is possible to um, to do this. But that's uh, for VHF. You see 88 to 208 megahertz. So on VHF, you're going to have less turns. Yeah. Yeah. So you just want to make it look like that, just more turns. Thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Any other coax questions or feedline questions? Cool. So what I, I'll do, I'm just going to take a couple minutes to talk about um, studying either for your upgrade uh, or for your first ham radio license. Um, I want to put a plug out for hamstudy.org. Um, I used to uh, kind of promote and plug another paid service, um, but after I've kind of seen this and they've made huge improvements in the last couple of years, uh, especially due to COVID. This is a great way if you are kind of an online learner to study for your ham test. Um, they do all three, technician, general, and extra. Um, you would create an account so that you can keep track of like which questions you got wrong versus which questions you got right. It does kind of a, um, uh, a review so that you'll see the questions that you got wrong more often than you see the questions that you got right. Um, and they have a couple of different like study mode, uh, read the questions, and then they even do practice tests. So the question pool for the technician class is a little over 400 questions total. Um, a lot of people, when they're cramming or studying for it, they'll go through all the 400 questions once or twice, um, depending on how good of a um, uh, memory you have. And then you can actually start taking practice tests. Once you get to about 80, 85%, go take the test. Don't wait around, like don't try to get 100%. Um, so that's a great way. It's a free way to study. If you're more of a, a book learner, um, there are several um, companies that put out books um, that give you the questions and answers. Plus they'll give you, you know, a few paragraphs on why it's the correct answer. So uh, here's an example of, of a newer one, um, a newer company called the Easy Way, Easy Way Handbooks. Um, and they have technician, general, and extra. The one that I studied for um, back in the late 80s is uh, WB6 NOA, Gordon West. He's been around for a very long time. Um, the thing about books is you want to just make sure that they are covered, they're the question test or question pool that is currently active. So question pools expire every three years. Um, there's not a lot of changes to them, but there's enough that if you're going to buy a book, buy one that's uh, that's um, new. So here's another uh, good way to study for it. The other way I would say is um, just online. Uh, you can go onto YouTube and Dave Kassler is a very prolific YouTube um, ham radio teacher. And he has uh, a playlist called Technician Ham Radio License. It's 38 videos. Uh, most recently updated in March, and he goes through all the sections of the question pool, uh, for example, like Ohm's Law and Radio Equipment Basics, and he'll go through videos that are, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes in length, and he'll describe and show you why um, these questions or why the answers are the correct uh, answer for the question. Um, again, it's free. Uh, it's just on YouTube. Dave Kassler is certainly not the only person 
that makes videos for how to pass your technician test, but it's, uh, it's, he's very good. The other one um, that if I were to do it again, this is probably one way I would definitely do it is just um, using uh, audiobooks in your car. Uh, it is a little bit harder to, you know, describe some of the, um, the charts and graphs that might be on your test, um, but you could easily just study those questions uh, later. But here is an example of a, an audiobook that is um, almost 15 hours in length, um, but it covers the entire test. Uh, and so in a week or two weeks or however long your commute is, you can actually get a really good uh, leg up on studying for your ham test. So these are kind of the three ways that, or four ways, I guess, that I would kind of recommend uh, either studying for or studying for your upgrade. I would give a big plug to hamstudy.org, the one you put up first for two reasons. One is the way it displays the questions looks exactly like it does on the test. So you're not surprised when you go into the test and you see these questions and answers, it looks exactly the same. And secondly, if you are the kind of person like I am, just memorizing answers isn't good enough. I wanna have explanations. And the way they provide the explanations is you're looking at the question and then there's a little check thing that you can click in the upper right corner, I think it is. And, and it shows you the reason why that answer is the answer. And it's, it's, it's really instructive. Just anyway, for me, it was great. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Yeah, the ham radio study uh, or hamstudy.org, they are the ones probably, and the, one of the reasons why it looks familiar is because that same group uh, produced software for uh, volunteer examiners in order to run these online uh, testing sessions. So they're, they're a great group and I am thoroughly impressed with how well they put together software that automates testing people. Cool, any other questions? I got one, yeah. it's related to the, the amateur X drive and I got my technician in general within a few days of each other and I'm the kind of person who actually likes to like, derive the numbers rather than just memorize. And I want to understand kind of how that, how the interaction is. And I had a hard time, not a hard time, but I ended up memorizing some of the answers simply because you can't have a pencil or paper for the online testing. They were very limited in what you could, you could use a little calculator on the, on your screen, but you couldn't write anything down. So I'm just wondering, is there a, should I bite the bullet and just go, it can still do that, but memorize all the answers rather than just work them out. Um, or are they going to go to in-person testing anytime in the foreseeable future? This is for my, my amateur extra. Yeah. Where there's a little bit more math. The, the others were pretty, I'll say, right, they were easy, but I'm guessing there might be more actual math here that you would want to maybe write down a formula. Yeah, I think, well, no, this, realize this was over 30 years ago. When I took the, um, the extra test, I ended up um, sort of doing a hand cram just on my own by reading the um, ARRL book. And that did give me some uh, explanation as to, you know, why the question or why the answer is the correct one. So it wasn't like just pure memorization of um, the questions. Um, so you're, you're, that's a great question um, because it is kind of nice to, um, be able to work it out. But after seeing the questions uh, twice or two and a half times, I ended up just subconsciously memorizing the, the answer so that when I read this particular question, I just knew the answer had the 1.4 in it. Um, so I wouldn't, if your goal is to pass the test, I wouldn't worry too much about it because it is not too dissimilar from the technician in general. Um, however, if you really want to have a pencil and a paper that you can write stuff down on. Um, that's actually a good question. And maybe if you wanna visit the AH7HW uh, website, just ask Herb Wiener is the, um, the group director, I guess, for that. He may actually allow you to uh, have um, blank uh, paper and pencil. As I remember, um, we did actually allow somebody to do that. Um, however, in-person testing, as far as I know, is actually going on. Um, I don't know of any Bruce or anybody else. Do you know of any Portland area in person that's going on? 
I, I haven't checked, so I'm under the impression no, but I could be uh, using obsolete information. But I, uh, Max, I, uh, I have the same recollection as you do. It's been a couple months since I uh, helped uh, with the local online testing. Um, but we definitely allowed paper and pencil as long as the person could hold up the paper and show that it was blank at the beginning of the test. And in, in fact, a couple of the students that attended my course, um, before they started answering questions, they wrote the Gordon West uh, uh, Ohm's Law and power equation uh, uh, diagrams on their scratch paper uh, from memory. And uh, Held, kind of held it up for the examiners and we all smiled and said, sure, that's legal. If you if you commit it to memory, you can put it on paper. Use as long as you start out with blank paper. Yeah, actually, um, uh, sorry, I just looked up the um, the A7HW website and in the instructions, it does say that you're supposed to have a clear work area with no um, books, papers, electronic devices, or other material. Um, however, you, um, you're permitted, uh, sorry, I just lost the, Oh, so you're permitted to have a single sheet of scratch paper that is blank on both sides. What, 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 thank you very much. Because when I took my technician in general, they were extremely um, clear. It was through uh, something on the East Coast. They weren't no paper at all. So this is actually really encouraging. What was the website you said for that? So I just put it in the chat, um, but it is aa 7 Oh, see it. Thank yeah. you. Great. Thank you so much, folks. Yeah. There are a few clubs in the Portland area that are, well, they were until at least recently, like in the last week or two, who knows, um, but that had gone back to doing some in-person classes, uh, not classes, but testing. Um, there's some testing being done by the Hoodview Club that um, they were doing in-persons. So, and I think somebody out in Tualatin had, I've seen done. And then the online testing, I've, it took me a couple of tries to get, to get to my general. And I tried a couple of different testing services and some of them <clears throat> were very, we'll just use the word particular, right? To the point of, I couldn't take my glasses off and on. I had to leave them on or off, right? which is kind of excessive in my opinion, while others were much more reasonable. So um, if you decide to do the online version, ask before you get in the middle of it, um, is, is my suggestion. And I put in the, the chat link also, it's the ARRL um, find an amateur radio license exam session. And so these are um, all, well, I think most of them or all of them are in person. So you can see that I just um, entered my zip code and it came up, uh, it looks like they're doing uh, Portland, Troutdale, Vancouver, Washington. Um, and they're coming up uh, in two days, um, in about a week and about a month. I know the Tualatin Valley Amateur Radio Club does it like the first Saturday of each month for testing. Yep, looks like it's this Saturday at 10 a.m. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? So one of the, um, uh, so Dan, who I think might be He's not still online. He was earlier, but um, one of the things that he, he's a, a, a very sold on uh, ladder line. Um, and one of the tuners that he really loves is the Johnson matchbox. And this is, it's an old, um, you know, matchbox bef uh, that were a lot of them made before um, coax existed, uh, which I think was in the fifties for specialty and the sixties for everybody else. Um, but this is a, a, a way that you can tune um, your ladder line, because like Bruce was saying, when you're using ladder line, uh, you have to get your antenna to resonate at the same as your, um, your feed line. So this is a, a great little box that you hook the ladder line up into the back of, 
And then from the back, you also uh, plug in a short piece of coax to your radio. Oh, you're view muted. Sorry about that. You said a nice little box. Those things are huge. <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah, they're they're about the size of a, a smaller um, radio, I guess. <laughs> you you wouldn't want to take this backpacking. Cool. Any other questions? Well, I want to thank you, Bruce, very much for presenting uh, a great presentation um, this week. And Fred, thanks for all your knowledge as usual. No problem. Yeah. Do, do you have a minute after uh, the meeting? Yeah. I'd like to talk to you about something, ask you a question, basically. Yeah. I have a question. Go ahead. Ah, OK. Hi, my, my name is Richard. I have a, <clears throat> a, a long wire for my HF transceiver and i just did that because that's what i did when i was 12 years old <laughs> and uh and, th and therefore i have a a tuner an antenna tuner uh, with that and that's all i know really <laughs> uh does all this other stuff uh matter in my circumstance um i don't have a ladder line to the antenna i just have a coax um that's all i know <laughs> Anybody want to say something that might enlighten me? Uh, yeah, like Fred said, oh, I was just going to say, like Fred said before, you don't necessarily need ladder line, especially if you're first starting out. Uh, it's not the most convenient feed line. But Fred, what were you going to say? So the thing is, um, uh, the, pr the prime with uh, a random length wire, first of all, it's not random. You have to avoid some of the length because otherwise you're going to have a very, very bad match on some of the frequency. And so the, the length is, it's not that random. It's kind of, um, you can have a, a bunch of different lengths of wire, but, uh, but there is some length that you really need to avoid depending on the frequency you want to work. But the problem is uh, those antenna, it, it's, an un, um, it's a non-resonant antenna. So you may want to work 40 meters, for example, and you're going to have a very high SWR. So those antenna, they're going to work very well if you put the antenna tuner at the antenna. If you look online, you're going to see most of the antenna that are sold like that. For example, uh, they're going to, uh, if you look at um, um, ICOM, for example, they have a tuner or even Yezu, they have a tuner for random length wire, something that you install you know, on the wall uh, under the eave, the eave of your roof, and then you have your wire going into the trees because um, uh, they, they, and then you, you have the, the coax going from that tuner to the radio. The, the antenna will work very well if you do something like that. It will perform very, very bad if you are going from your antenna that is unmatched to uh, your, you know, inside your house using a, a, a long piece of coax, because in that case, you're gonna have a ton of losses. Thank so it, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it works. It, it, you know, like I say, it depends. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, Fred, is it correct that uh, another solution is to uh, put a, uh, a four, 49 to 1 ballon at uh, the feed point and then uh, the antenna tuner can uh, potentially be moved in to the shack? Okay. It depends. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of details to work out. <laughs> yeah. No, but the, the, so the thing is, um, uh, so you want to work that antenna on different uh, bands. So if you put a ballon, you, uh, not a ballon, if you put a, a transformer, so uh, a four to one or a nine to one uh, ballon, so then you're going to lower the impedance. So if you have um, you know, a thousand ohm impedance and you divide that thing by four, uh, you're gonna have uh, you know, 250 ohm impedance. So your antenna tuner will be happier matching that thing. It will be easier for the antenna tuner, but you still have, you're still gonna have a, you know, a five or six or seven to one SWR. And that's what's gonna cause the losses. So the losses, if you have a long piece of coax, the loss will compound. If you have a short run, that may work. Okay. And, okay. and the thing you're gonna need also, sorry, 
the thing you're going to need is you're going to have to have a, a bunch of chokes on your antenna because it's an unbalanced antenna. It's you know really really unbalanced, and you're going to have a ton of common mode current, and uh, your coax will be the so when you have a, a dipole, you have your coax coming here and you have one piece of uh, antenna going on that side and one piece of going on that side. A random wire is you have your coax and you have just one wire. Mm -hmm. So where do you think the second wire is? That's gonna be your coax. The so at some, at some point uh, you want to choke that RF on that coax because otherwise it's gonna get into your house and that's gonna cause you know, a lot of trouble with uh, your other um, electronic uh, devices in your house. Those antenna usually they're used by people who are doing SOTA because they work low power and they're pretty close to the antenna. So they have a short run of, of uh, coax. The coax, their radio themselves, they are the counterpoise. But since they're using low power, that's fine. Richard, are you um, thinking of uh this kind of antenna for your shack or out in the field? Oh, uh, no, this is in my home. Okay. Uh, and I set up uh, you know, several years ago and I got the, the, the certain specific length that I was shooting for and I cut the red and cut the wire at that length and then hung it across my top of my house. And, and uh, okay. <laughs> yes. <Yeah, so> <laughs> I am sorry, I, I'm sorry. It's, I, I feel like I'm the bearer of bad news. <laughs> so is it a is it a dipole or is it a it is it, okay it's just a length of wire yeah yeah so yeah. it's so an that, end fed is what that's called it's it's one of the end fed so you're going to see a two uh, you're going to see end fed antenna that's one of them and you're going to see half wave end fed antenna that's also an end fed antenna but then they use a specific length of wire to try to be close to resonance on some of the specific frequency yeah. The problem, they're going to be the same on both of those antenna. So okay. the upper, upper okay. right hand corner here is just an example of uh, somebody mm -hmm. commercially selling a, a half wave and fed antenna. Mm -hmm. um, they, they work okay. Uh, my experience with them is they're, they're not a great antenna. Um, however, they, they're perfectly acceptable if it's all you can string up. A lot of people, they just don't have the real estate to put up a proper yeah. dipole. Yeah. Uh, it's much better for soda. Uh, I this is my favorite antenna for soda, just because um, it's so portable, so lightweight. I can put it up vertically. Um, it's for me. I like it better than a, a dipole, but you know, a dipole is not too hard either um, out in the field. Uh, by the way, if you you say you don't have a um, space in your house, but a dipole, you don't have to put your dipole straight. It can be um, you know your wire can be kind of in zigzag and can be. A, you know, flat and drooping down. Uh, you, I mean, it, it, it doesn't have to, or it can be an inverted V. You don't have to have something that is, you know, perfectly straight. Okay, maybe I'll do that next. So Mike, do you have a comment? Me? Yeah. Yeah, so if you were going to do a dipole, then I could run just coax and I wouldn't have the same issues that Richard is concerned with. And then I would. It would be more like a standard installation. Yes, am I am I reading that correctly? <laughs> it depends. You're about to say. <laughs> well, yeah, I have say. No idea. <laughs> uh, so the, the the thing is the um, I, I think Richard uh, wants to use that antenna uh, because it's a multiband antenna. It's a non-resonant antenna. You put a tuner and you have a multiband antenna. The dipole, it's a monoband antenna. So mm -hmm. if you put a dipole on 20 meters or 40 meters, and mm -hmm. you have, uh, like you said, you put your choke at the, at the top of your dipole, you go straight down with uh, your coax and you go to your radio, that's gonna be perfect. You're gonna, you won't have any problems because uh, you're gonna work 40 meters. But then mm -hmm. if you want to work 20, that's where the it depends comes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Um... I finally got my antenna put back up over my house after it fell down in the last ice storm. So I thought, well, maybe we ought to learn something about this before I go talk to sheep ranchers in Montana. Which is what I do, apparently. <laughs> All right, are we through? May I leave? <laughs> 
Hey, when are you guys going to meet again? Uh, so you mean online or? Well, I mean, uh, when you're going to have a second class or is this the only class you're doing? Oh, no, uh, this is weekly. Okay. So next, next week, same time? Same time. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Because I've never done ham radio in, a, in any sequential way. Uh, I just did this and that and the other. And you know, so I thought maybe I could really learn something from the ground up. So oh, yeah, absolutely. Can, can, can I ask you a question? So um, why? So what? What do you want to do on ham radio? I I I was got into this when I was a kid because I was interested in electronics, and I still am. And I kind of like to know, you know, how what's going on in there, and uh, talk to some people who know what's going on in there. Uh, but I haven't had a lot of a uh, lot of fun with uh, high frequency because uh, you know I'm gonna talk to people and just like I say sheep farmers in Montana <laughs> whose uh, big die big thing was to take the wife to uh, uh, the, down to the, <laughs> the end into the city <laughs> to the Walmart <laughs> yeah, to the, exactly <laughs> or to the Sturgis the Sturgis rally in South Dakota <laughs> that is exactly it go to Walmart that is exactly it yeah so uh, I'm just well, I, I was pressuring. saying that because uh, a few weeks ago I talked to someone. I don't. I don't think he was in Montana. The guy was living in the middle of nowhere, and he was telling me that he, you know, to go to Walmart that was taking him two hours drive yeah. to to go to the closest uh, Walmart. Yeah. And um, and he was saying, oh yeah, it's a it's a bummer when you forget something and you have to go back. Yeah. That's yeah. Those are the guys. <laughs> So if you, I mean, if you're interested by uh, talking to people, doing rag shoe, talking to people, you should uh, consider going on digital. Mm -hmm. Most of the rag shoe I'm doing right now on, dig on HF, it's uh, hard to have a rag shoe with someone because the conditions are bad. Yeah. Everyone is on FT8. Yeah. And, uh, and like you said, you end up with the people either renting about, um, you know, the government and, and that's all or, or, or you know, or they don't want to talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, but on on digital, that's where I talk to people right now. Well, by digital, what do you mean? Um, I mean a C four FM, DMR, a D star, any anything. You you get a small uh, cheap radio, a Yezu, for example, is hundred and forty bucks, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, a Raspberry Pi with a hat, it's uh, less than a hundred bucks, and you talk to the world. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So it's okay. going to be connected to the internet, but you're going to meet people. Okay. Good. So you're using D Star on the internet, not not actually going over the radio. No, no, I have a radio. I'm talking to a radio. The radio. So when you are on your car and you are talking to uh, Max or on the repeater, you have a you know on the mountain you have a repeater. Instead of having a repeater on the mountain, I have a tiny repeater that is big like that that is uh, in my garage, and that's my my repeater basically. Hmm. So I talk with a real radio. That's what I I. You know, I talk with. Yeah, but it and goes over. The so, if, at some point. you know, effectively, uh, you have some signal that goes through the internet. But, um, but hey, you're saying I, I can get a hat for this guy and start doing D Star. Yeah. So, if you look at the, um, uh, you know, the first on the on the left side, uh, the, the the one with the two antenna or the one with the tiny one with the one antenna, that's a that's a. a, a uh, it's a D-Star, I mean, you can do D-Star, DMR, C4FM, uh, Next Age, a bunch of different modes. Okay. And yeah, we'll have a, um, I think actually we did have a uh, program on hotspots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you take a look back in our um, YouTube channel, uh, you'll see that there's a, a program on hotspots. Um, however, there's there's plenty of YouTube channels or plenty of YouTube videos on people um, uh, describing hotspots, um, both how to buy and how to build. Some of these digital modes would be great if you did a digital modes thing and talk about yeah. like, I mean, there's digital modes I can do through this Pi going on to the radio, I'm sure. You know, yeah. Yes. FL Digi has a whole suite of things. And so, but, so, but it, to do voice, I thought, so is there, to do digital voice, I would want to be doing D-Star, DMR, that kind of thing, or, or are there other? Yeah. 
DMR is going to be the, 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 the one that is going to be uh, in terms of knowledge and things to learn the, you know, the hardest, uh, the hardest to, uh, to understand and to learn. But um, uh, D star, uh, you know, in the order of complexity, the simpler one is uh, C4FM, Yezu basically. Uh, then uh, you have a uh, D star and then far in front, you have a uh, DMR in terms of complexity. And don't forget one thing is, uh, uh, you know, for example, with that C4FM radio, I can talk to people that are on D star or on DMR. You have some reflectors that are doing cross mode uh, translation. So you can, you, you're not just limited to talking to people on, 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 on C4FM, you can talk to other people on other type of uh, radio. Yeah. I've, got long, yeah, I've got a long background in computer networking and such, so I, I DMR doesn't doesn't um, what do you call it scare me. And if you ever want to scare you, Mike. <laughs> oh, go ahead. You scare me, Richard. Here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'll quietly leave, but I appreciate it. And I'll be back uh, next week uh, unless uh, what is unless this something happens. Here, Matt, Max, what are you oh, showing? Yeah, so I was, I'm going to say, if you ever want to get like a feel for what uh, digital radio or, or DMR is, um, just go to um, the uh, Brandmeister um, hose line or hose.brandmeister.network. Um, and you can basically through your PC or your phone or tablet, you can actually listen to people talking on DMR. Oh, because I know there's, there's other things like that too with software defined radio, they have websites that you can listen to. Yep, exactly. All sorts of stuff all over the place. So I'll put that link in the, in the chat. And I think the last thing I just wanted to mention that like some of the upcoming future meetings. So next week, we're going to talk about um, ham radio go bags and go kits, um, followed by digital modes. Um, we'll talk oh. about <laughs> ham radio. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> the, so digital modes are specifically like the, uh, the non-voice kind, the FS, uh, FT8 and PSK31. Um, then we'll talk about amateur radio equipment reviews and finally power poles.